ونبينا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون صدق الله العظيم We are in the first uh, days of the month of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar, the Hijri calendar, Muharram al-Haram. And this month comes at the end of the three consecutive sacred months, Al-Qadab al-Hijjah and Muharram. And then Rajab is also uh, the one of the sacred months that's uh, on its own uh, separately uh, but these three are one after another al-qadab al-hijjah in muharram the month of uh, muharram is a special one amongst the sacred months the month of muharram was chosen to be the last of the three consecutive sacred months, but the first month of the Islamic calendar. And it's a reminder of the nature of of things, of the nature of life, that things are cyclical, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world in such a way that things rotate and revolve and change and go back to an original state you have the experience of different seasons uh, and you have spring and you have summer and then you have autumn you have winter and then the cycle continues these are signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the physical realm but the sign that we should be focusing on in the month of Muharram is the spiritual sign and the spiritual significance of these blessed months of these sacred months that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain places sacred and so you call it the Haram or Masjid al-Haram uh, and the, the root word Haramim it uh, shows sacredness that a place is sacred so Masjid al-Haram is the sacred mosque the Haram is that uh, area within which Kaaba and Masjid al-Haram are located that is uh, sacred and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made these months also sacred now does it mean that you worship Allah and in these months and not in the other months no because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord at all times and we owe him worship at all times but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes these places and these times sacred it's a reminder that we have this uh, antennas if you will as believers that you experience the holiness and the sacredness and the beauty of these times and these places if if you have the the basira if you have uh, the, the 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 lens and the prism of iman that for a person that doesn't believe it doesn't matter muharram doesn't matter ramadan al qada al hajjah they don't feel any difference for someone who doesn't believe if they go to makkah to medina to masjid al aqsa even 
open the doors of the cab for them, they'll probably feel nothing. The antennas are missing. The device that is supposed to connect and to receive is not there. And so in these times, you have more of an awareness as a believer of the purpose of your life, of your spiritual imperatives, of the things that you should be focused on as a believer at all times. You feel those things in a sharper way in these times. And this is not just a theory, it's experiential practice, right? We all experience this as believers. We know the kind of spirituality, the kind of ecstasy that you feel in the month of Ramadan. There is no way you can recreate that. You can gather a whole bunch of people. You can have a gathering. You can even pray Aisha and maybe even fast that day and then have some Qiyam and Nawafil together. It'll be a faith-boosting experience, of course, and it'll be beautiful, but it would really pale in comparison to the experience of the believer in the month of Ramadan. And so, in these special times and these special places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed a type of hidden barakah, a type of hidden holiness and sacredness that you experience proportionate to the level of your Iman. And so, where you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how you will receive these times and these places. But these places and times are also opportunities for you to sharpen your reception of the Divine. To be a, a believer uh, that really goes through those deep, profound feelings of spirituality in these times. And so to encourage us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us to, to be aware of these places and times and to receive them intentionally. You have to be intentional about it. You cannot go through the experience of Ramadan or Muharram or the Hijjah, any of these sacred times or even the sacred places if the intention is not there, if the realization is not there of how profound and how significant these places and these times of holiness are. So you have to have that realization, you have to have that niya and that intention. And to make it, uh, to facilitate that for, for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us reminders. The Prophet Sallallahu gives us reminders. So all of the virtues that you hear about, that you learn about, the virtues of fasting in the month of the Hijjah, the first 10 days of the Hijjah, the, the virtue of fasting in this month of Muharram, any of the days, one narration says, fasting of one day of Muharram is the equivalent of 30 days. And then the Qiyam, the fasting of Ashura, the 10th, day of this month uh, is, is something that's extremely um, uh, it, it's, it, it's profoundly beautiful and, and about which the Prophet Wasallam has said that I hope that the fasting of the day of Ashura will expiate for the uh, sins of the previous year and so it's a beautiful day where the fasting of this one day gives you the erasure and the removal of all of your previous year's misdeeds. That's profound. That's just a, a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we get to experience, that we have an opportunity to experience. But you have to do it and you have to recognize the sacredness and the holiness of this time. And so this very holy and sacred time of the month of Muharram is a time for us to also think about this month as the first of the, the months of the Islamic calendar. This is the first month 
And a sacred month is the first month. And a sacred month is also the last month. So this Islamic calendar that doesn't recognize seasons, that's not tied to spring or summer or fall or winter, that revolves around the entire year. You have experience of Ramadan and the summer and in the winter. The same with all the other months. The importance of, of this is that you're not attached in your spiritual reality to any of these physical things. That your spiritual existence and experience is freed. And it's uh, something that's above your limited physical uh, attachments. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of that. And then He begins for us and ends for us our year. The year by which we calculate our fast, our hajj, and all of these other blessed times. Uh, he begins it and ends it with a sacred month, with a holy month. So we end with the hijjah. Not only is it just, it's not just a holy month, it's also the month of Hajj. And it begins with the uh, Muharram, which is a sacred month uh, in which the day of Ashura occurs, uh, which is a time to increase our spirituality, a time to reconnect, and a time to reflect upon renewal. A, a time to think about new beginnings. It is said that this is the time, this is the day on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the tawbah of Adam alayhi salam when he was expelled from Jannah. This is the time in which Allah azza wa jalla saved the people of Musa alayhi salam. They had a new beginning. They were saved from Fir'aun and his army and they had a new beginning to live in, in freedom and to be able to realize and to be given the opportunity to realize and pursue the divine plan for them. It is a time in which uh, many other incidents and profound events happened with varying degrees of authenticity. These are narrated, but they all have one common theme and the common theme is a new spiritual beginning. A new beginning in the spiritual sense. And so, when we reflect on the day of Ashura, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, he realized that the people of the book were fasting on this day, and he asked, why is it that they are fasting? And he was told that this is the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from Fir'aun and his army. And the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, we are near and we have more of a right to Musa alayhi salam and his, his pure message of monotheism. We are better connected to that and we are the true inheritors of that message. And so therefore we would also fast on this day. And if I were to live uh, to experience this next year, I would fast Tasu'a and Ashura, meaning I would fast uh, the 9th and the 10th. And so it is in, in, in our tradition to fast the 9th and the 10th, or the 10th and the, and the 11th, uh, to just fast two days, so that there is a distinction. There is a distinction that this is an Islamic practice, a prophetic uh, practice. So this uh, fasting of the day of Ashura, as we mentioned, has all of this virtue, all of these blessings, uh, and it has um, it's uh, tied to so much in the history of, uh, of the Prophets, peace be upon them, uh, before our beloved Prophet It is also tied to an extremely, extremely tragic incident, uh, a tragedy that occurred uh, not too long after the Prophet met his Lord. And it is something that uh, the, the most profound thing about the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anhu alayhi salam is that it unites this ummah. One of the things that we may not realize is that 
we may think that uh, from what we see on social media and all of the rancor and uh, uh, the dis you know the disagreements and sometimes even violence that's out there uh, still till this day all of that they are, they are much smaller in comparison to the status of the day of Ashura as a uniter of this Ummah as a uniter of all of the believers regardless of which sect they think they belong to this idea of various sects and, and various groups is just uh, an interesting one that uh, of course when you look at the message of the Qur'an it's not something that's recognized the Qur'an talks about إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا we are one ummah, but we do have various ways of approaching the deen, and uh, there are some that uh, we may disagree with, they may disagree with us. The reality is that these disagreements are not going to go away. The reality is that this is the sunnah and the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His creation. The Quran has promised that. They will always uh, have these differences, some, sometimes uh, in, in negative ways, but sometimes it's in beautiful ways that we have these differences that are expressions and manifestations of the beauty of, of, of this deen. The diversity of thought and opinion that has existed in this ummah is something that we can truly be proud of because it has led to building bridges, it has led to uh, sharper minds, it has, it has led to a deeper study of the deen. I mean, who, who would dig into the history if they weren't trying to kind of uh, find evidence to support their take on history? And so there's rahmah and blessing and all of that, that this, this ummah knows a lot more about its history uh, because sometimes they differ on things and so uh, that message of unity is something that may be lost on some but it's everywhere to be seen and experienced there are parts of the Muslim world where uh, the Hussein an, his message and his sacrifice uh, these bring people together they bring people together they worship together, they fast together, they celebrate together and what they, they, they realize is what they have in common is far more than the things that divide them. and so we have to be courageous as believers we have to be brave as believers and we have to focus uh, in, in particular in these kinds of times the, when we, we, ha we are in the month of Muharram to build bridges to talk to our brothers and sisters who we may disagree with on certain things because we do a lot of interfaith and we want to build bridges with people of other faiths but what about believers? what about the people of Qibla? what about uh, the people who believe in the Quran and the Prophet وسلم, who celebrate Hussein like we, we celebrate who respect him like we respect him who value his sacrifice and, uh, and, and think of it as a new beginning of selflessness, of, of standing up for the truth and of uh, giving the, the ultimate sacrifice that we have that in common, that we all share that in common and that there we have differences we acknowledge that we have differences but oftentimes what happens is we will take the worst examples from amongst the Sunnis the worst examples from amongst the Shias the most divisive and insulting speech given by a Shia scholar or by a Sunni scholar so-called scholar and we use that and we use that to stereotype. We use that to tell our community, folks in our community, that this is how all Sunnis are. 
This is how all Shias are. But if you were to be brave and courageous and go out there and talk to individuals who you don't agree with, you will find that the reality is very different. That all of this hate mongering is, doesn't have much basis. That there is so much we have in common. And in particular, this is something bizarre that in, in our Muslim community in the West and in America, it's even a thing that we have these very, very acrimonious relations with people who we differ with. Because we live amongst people, the majority of whom are not Muslim. And we always, and no one disagrees that it's important to have interfaith relations. No one disagrees that we have to have good relations with the, with the county, and with the police, and with, the, with, with different levels of government to advance our own interests and to give them a, a, a true picture of what Islam is all about and who Muslims are and what our needs are and what we've been contributing and so on and so forth. It looks like there's a consensus on that. But when it comes to people within our own ranks, we look down upon them, we don't want to talk to them, we don't want to gather with them. So I encourage all of us to take these opportunities when our Shia brothers and sisters, they gather, go to their gatherings. Going there does nothing to your faith, okay? So don't be scared. Uh, it doesn't mean you are now compromising and you are suddenly uh, uh, adopting their narrative. That's not the case. Just go there and listen and try to understand, listen to understand. And that goodwill will go a long way. Because like me and you, they also have been shown very extreme images, extreme speeches, uh, extreme rhetoric. And so they're holding back. And some of them may have very, uh, a, a very strange and a bad opinion of us. Uh, but that there is something we can do about that. And this starts with me and you, all of us, uh, to, to begin with that, giving people those excuses to believe that the, and the essential goodness of all human beings. When you approach any single human being, no matter who they are, it should be based on that assumption that presumption of innocence, that presumption of goodness, that fitrah that Allah has created all human beings. So when that's the case with any human being, where do you think a believer stands? Someone who you know says La ilaha illallah, and who you know says Muhammad Rasulullah, and you're still wary of them. There's something wrong with that picture. And we have, uh, Again, this diversity in, in Islam, and we have a powerful um, alternative narrative that the Shia community comes with. You may or may not agree with, with all of it or some of it, that's a separate thing. But the reality of an alternative narrative cannot be wished away. This is etched in the psyche of, of these communities, of our communities. Uh, people have written books, people have said things, that's indelible. That has been, you know, what has been done is done. What, what the truth of the matter is, all the details of the story of Karbala, for example, we would never know that. Only Allah knows the absolute truth of what happened and all the details. 